you don't know me, I'm Elena Goodnight. I'm on staff here. Um, we, I'm going to open us up with prayer, and then we're going to start with an activity today. Um, Lord, we thank you that you are good, that you love us, and that our value doesn't change. Lord, you said that we are enough to die for, and you did it. Lord, give us peace. Help us trust that. Amen. We're going to start with an activity today. It's going to seem a little savage. That's okay. Um, <laughs> We're going to pretend we're on a lifeboat, stranded in the middle of the ocean, and you're running out of food and water. So you have to figure out who you're going to cut, who you're going to throw overboard. <laughs> um, you're going to have two minutes. There should be a list. Yeah, there, you're going to have two minutes. Talk to the person next to you. Just partner up. Um, who are you for sure keeping, and who are you for sure throwing first? You got two minutes. Decide with your partner. <laughs> who are you cutting? Who are you saving? I have, I've heard zero, zero consensus. <laughs> oh, what's your consensus? We're throwing off the sea here and keeping the medical student in England for a second year. Yeah. How old are you? Oh, you're throwing yourself off? <laughs> Bold. I like it. I, no, I was just wondering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you throw, you throw you? Potentially, <laughs> that is self-sacrificial. Wow, beautiful. Um, it got wild in the front row. We're throwing the CIA agent. Yeah. Anywho, um, there is no correct answer to this prompt. It just highlights that we have different gauges on what we think makes someone valuable. We assess value based on age, job, relationships. What have they been through? What have they survived? What is their potential? A bunch of other ways. How can they help me? And we don't just do this in life or death situations. It's not just when you're out in the middle of the ocean and have to throw someone over the board. Um, this is like an underlying assessment that we just are kind of always making. It's how we can feel making friends and building resumes and applying for jobs, like your value is being evaluated. So what is the actual standard that makes someone valuable or not? What if the value expectations change depending on who you're talking to? What if they conflict with each other? This is a huge dilemma for the people pleasers in the room. <laughs> Always trying to assess, would I be valuable here? How is that going to mesh here? But if you're like, no, I definitely understand my value, great. That's awesome. Uh, but the enemy of our souls is going to fight against that truth. And he can seem pretty convincing, which is why this semester, um, we want to emphasize that our value is set. It can't be earned, it can't be lost. In God's kingdom, my value, your value, people's value is not transactional. 
it's not an equation of do this much plus obey this much equals become this valuable. We often live like that's the case, but the gospel just directly refutes that. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were sinners, he died for us. The message says, the message translation says it, uh, God put his love on the line for us while we were still of no use to him. So the value equation is actually Jesus died for us equals we are worth dying for, right? Like that doesn't change. There's no variables in that equation. Since the first part is true, the second part is true. So over the next few weeks, Margaret Curtis and I are each going to share about how we've wrestled with that reality because it is our reality. We're valuable, we're loved, we're wanted, even if we question it or flat out deny it. So to prep for this talk, I asked the Lord, when do I deny this? When do I question if my value or the value of others can be lost or earned? And to my surprise, he brought up a line <laughs> that I say many times throughout my life, and it feels fairly benign. It's just like a phrase. So I was like, mm, I don't know, God, give me something else. But that's all I heard. So here we are. <laughs> the line is, I would never. I would never. So I'll give a few examples. Uh, my freshman year of college, I was roommates with my best friend from high school. After years of being best friends, it took only a few weeks of college for us to barely speak anymore. And resentment just started consuming me. That line just played over and over in my head, like, I would never do this to her. I would never treat her this way. I don't understand how she's doing this. In college, Elena was also certain that she would never fall back into her eating disorder. I've had a difficult relationship with food since I was as far back as I can remember, honestly. But I started restricting food and over-exercising in the summer of like seventh grade. But I had healed a bit by the end of high school and I swore I would never let it get that bad again. I would look at my friends in super unhealthy dating relationships and be like, can't they see that this is not good? I would never. And before becoming a parent, I had so many things that I would never do. Many of you have probably heard me say these things. Uh, I would never let my baby watch that much TV. I would never let them sleep in the same bed with me. That's so dangerous. So here's how that line has made me question if value is set. I would never can easily shift to, I would never. So if you would, you're either stupid or intentionally doing evil. Either way, I'm better than you, right? It assumes superiority. Without ever saying it or realizing it, my I would never is often, I would never, so I'm more valuable than you which is just not how Jesus sees things, right? I mean, he would actually never sin. <laughs> he would actually never do that, and he still doesn't assume this posture of, I'm better than you. But I do. I'm so tempted to believe that I could be better than someone else, even though I was broken enough that Jesus needed to die on my behalf. I'm also loved enough that he was willing to die on my behalf. We're all in the same boat, <laughs> There is no more or less worthy in the kingdom of heaven. I would never can easily be translated into, you're toxic. That's like what we love to say these days, you're toxic. Today when people disagree, we don't usually hear, man, I'd love to understand your perspective. Can we get together and chat about it? <laughs> we just say, you're toxic, I'm going to cut you off and try to find people that align with me. But what if someone can have unhealthy behaviors and beliefs and still be worthy of connection and compassion? What if that's actually the case for all of us? What if we're in the same boat? <laughs> and there are certainly times that we need to distance or even end relationships. I'm not saying we should enable harmful behavior or stay in those things forever, but how cool would it be if we were so deeply aligned with God's heart that we could look at the people we've been hurt by and hope they're met with God's love and compassion and presence. And hope that they're blessed and transformed by encountering Jesus. Which is saying, I hope the same thing for you that I hope for me. We're in the same boat. I would never is often a gateway for shame. 
shame on you that you would do this thing that I would never. But what if I do the thing? Right? Romans 7 says, I don't really understand myself. I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. That is going to happen. We cannot willpower ourselves out of our humanity. Here's how those things that I said I would never do turned out for me. I cut people off that I had been walking closely with for years, just like my roommate did to me. I relapsed hard into disordered eating and would exercise for hours a day without, while living off of vegetable soup. I don't know why that was my food. I just really liked that vegetable soup. I dated someone hoping that they would make me feel complete, which is an unhealthy foundation that led to a very unhealthy relationship. And if you know me, when Riley and I wake up from sleeping in the same bed together, I love to kick off the day with some Miss Rachel on TV. There's all these things that I said I would never do <laughs> that I do. It's like God knew his audience when he wrote the Bible. It's just like Romans 7 said. And yet it still surprises me when I do that. When I say I would never do that and then I do it, I'm like, whoa, plot twist. Even though he says this is what's going to happen. <laughs> so instead of feeling shame and like, ah, I'd love to be quick to celebrate. Thank God. My value isn't lost or earned because I'm always going to make mistakes. Wouldn't that be a much cooler response than defensiveness and shame? Just celebrating, gosh. And again, my value is not lost or earned. Thank the Lord. Do you see how this benign phrase of I would never has given the enemy a foothold in my life? How it's been used to subtly make me question my value and the value of others. I do have one more example of using that phrase, and it makes me so uncomfortable that I really debated sharing it. Bear with me, it is going to get dark. <laughs> Last year, on September 16th, I'm going to keep saying that date until all of you know Riley's birthday, but I gave birth to that majestic little human. And at the hospital, they made us watch this video on shaken baby syndrome. It was the worst. I hated it. My super hormonal self, hormonal self was just like, wanted to throw up. It was awful. And after the video, they make us sign waivers promising not to shake Riley. They're like, don't do it. Just if you're overwhelmed, put her in her crib, go outside and breathe. And I'm like, yeah, obviously I'm not going to shake her. I'm going to go outside and breathe. And I, yeah, Curtis and I both were like, oh, obviously we would never do that. And let the record show we have not shaken Riley. That's not where this is going. We have not shaken Riley. But like a couple weeks in, we looked at each other and we were like, oh my gosh, we get it. Like we get why they had to show us a video and teach us coping techniques and sign a waiver because after weeks of sleep deprivation, being screamed at for a few hours mm, gets you to a point of desperation and frustration that I didn't know I could hit. And I was like, just be quiet, just go to sleep. <laughs> and yeah, I hated seeing that. Curtis and I both were like, ooh, that's the ugliness of our own souls that we did not want exposed. And as I prayed over this talk, the Lord's question to me was, what if you had? Like, what if you had shaken that sweet little baby and caused her immense harm, maybe death? Like, how do you think I would respond to you? I told you it was going to get dark. How do you think I'd respond to you in that? And I hate that question. If I had done that, I'd want to say, do not show me mercy. Like, all value goes out the window. That is the point where the gospel is no longer true for me. I get that you say you're going to love me at my darkest. Do not love me there. I don't deserve it. Ding, ding, ding. We have found a lie <laughs> that my soul believes. It's deep in there, but it's there. Because his love is never deserved, right? That's what I say. It's never earned. It's always given. But I believe there's a point where it can be lost. Saying I don't deserve to be met with love there implies that I do deserve to be met with love if I behave better, right? So how would God actually respond to me if I did something that awful? I think this passage in Matthew gives me an idea. It's taking place right after Jesus and his disciples ate the Last Supper together. They've taken communion. They've sang a hymn together. All seems good. 
they're walking on their way to the Mount of Olives. Starting in verse 31, it says, On the way, Jesus told them, he's talking to his disciples, Tonight all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter, one of his disciples that I really resonate with, <laughs> declared, Even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. And Jesus replies, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times, or you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples about the same. So Jesus has spent three years with these disciples. They are his 12 closest friends. He's loved them unconditionally. He's taught them, empowered them, grieved with them, celebrated with them. They have walked together. And one of those disciples, Judas, is about to turn Jesus over to the authorities, and he will be murdered. It'd be really nice to have your closest friends in your corner at a time like this, but Jesus knows all of them are going to desert him. But it's crazy to me that he knew this would happen when he picked them. Right? They weren't chosen because they would be perfectly loyal to him. He picked 12 normal, messed up people and walked closely with them. It's also amazing to me that he tells Peter, you're about to desert me without trying to convince him not to. And that's just, that's wild to me. Jesus, what a guy. And Peter's response makes sense to me. He's like, I would never. I bet the thought of abandoning Jesus and seeing him taken by the authorities and tortured to death made Peter want to throw up just like the idea of shaking Riley makes me want to throw up. It's dark. You know, it's a decision void of any goodness. It causes devastating harm to someone innocent. But I think the hardest part for me to understand in this whole scripture is the part in line 32, where God says, I have, after I've been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of, of you to Galilee and meet you there. I'm still going to connect with you. After this huge betrayal, I will meet you there. Jesus is not condoning Peter's decision. He's not saying, what you're doing is fine. Just like shaking Riley is never going to be fine. He's also not cutting Peter off, though. He's not saying, if you do this, you're going to lose all value and I'm done with you. He promised, even though you think you would never do this thing, you are going to do it. You're going to do something dark and evil and shameful, and I will meet you there. I mean, sheesh, I have literally contemplated cutting off someone because they chew too loudly. Like, I'm not exaggerating. My best friend was eating a banana, and in my head I was like, why is the Lord giving me his toughest battles? Like, he's chewing so loudly. And then I just was like, all right, Lord, don't worry, I'll... I'll behave. And then I was like, you're being super annoying right now. And it was really hurtful. And so, yeah, my line apparently is a banana, like chewing a banana. Oof. Cut you off. The unconditional love that Jesus offers is just baffling to me. It's hard to accept. It confuses me. It makes way more sense if I could earn it and if my value shifted along with my actions. But that's transactional. Jesus doesn't view us transactionally. It's not like input-output. He doesn't only die for the best of the best. He doesn't choose to connect with us based on what we can give him. He doesn't withhold compassion when we hit a certain level of sinfulness. My value is set. Your value is set. Our value is set. <laughs> Even when we disagree with people or have been hurt by them, the value is set. The gospel is always true. To put that Romans 5.8 verse in context, the God loved us while we were sinners. I think we could say God loves us and wants to connect with us even when we do toxic things. That's good news. I wonder if part of our exhaustion and anxiety stems from all of our value assessments. You know, we're always trying to prove that we're enough and looking around to see how we compare against others. And it makes it really difficult to believe the gospel. No, it's like we're living this lifeboat game in real life. But we don't need to assess. You know, we're all messy and we're all loved. Those are happening at the same time. 
we're not able to earn or lose the value that Jesus freely gives us. And this idea goes against everything we're told by the world. So we're going to need consistent help if we're going to believe it. And my hope is that as a community, we can do that together. That we can extend to each other what Christ extended to us. That in the dark moments, we'll look at each other and say, God is going to meet you there, and so am I. Again, this is not advocating staying in super toxic, actual toxic, harmful, manipulative behavior, but I don't think that happens as often as we think it does. <laughs> so God is going to meet you in this dark place, and so am I. Which does mean we're going to have to reveal parts of ourselves that we would prefer to keep hidden, which is scary. But if you're only loved when you're helpful or fun or a great friend, that's not good news. That's the expectation, right? That makes sense to us, and it's terrifying if we mess up, right? If that's, if that's how it is, because then you're only loved at your best, and value is conditional. So instead, God's been inviting me to share the, the messier, less useful, unrefined parts of who I am, and I always get nervous sharing those. I mean, it's like how I debated sharing that story about shaking Riley. I'm like, I don't like that you guys know that that's in my soul. Like, hmm, that's, that's some evil stuff. <laughs> But being met with love in those dark and messy places, that feels like good news. If I'm going to be loved in my worst, I can breathe a sigh of relief. My value is set. You know? So I hope God meets you with that good news too. That you will never be perfect and you will always be loved. We are in the same boat. So at Storehouse, we trust that the Spirit is working through all followers of Jesus and not just the person speaking from the front. Um, so we like to give space for some communal discussion. So we're going to break up into groups and just chat. Chat about what stood out to you. And that can be like, oh, I really like that, or I really hated that, or I disagree with that. Just what stood out to you. Um, if it confused you, whatever. And then how may Jesus be trying to meet you there?